Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to PrepMedic. This week's video, we're talking about acute stress and why it makes first responders suck at their jobs. Clickbait intro aside, uh, this week I really want to talk about uh, our stress reactions and ways that we can mitigate them. While I do have some studies we're going to talk about here, mainly I want to tell you about my experiences and how I have I have personally had these things happen to me and had to mitigate them in both my personal and professional practice. Now, don't get it mixed up. I am not talking about mental health. I'm not talking about PTSD. I'm not even talking about acute stress syndrome. I'm talking about how being under heavy loads of stress that are common in first responder groups, so police, fire, EMS, and the military, how those stress loads can make us really bad at things that we were not bad at in the classroom. They can diminish all sorts of both psychological, physiologic responses. So you might be asking, or you might not be asking, uh, why I'm doing this video now. And it really started with a couple of comments on some of my videos where I said, hey, if you get a cat tourniquet, it comes with instructions, and you should just toss the instructions because they're just going to get in the way. And people were saying, hey, no, you should absolutely keep the instructions on the cat tourniquet. Uh, a bystander that doesn't know how to use it might come up, and they might uh, only be able to apply it with the instructions. They might have to read through those uh, before they can render aid. And my response to that was that's that's not realistic. Now, while these instructions have gotten a lot better than they did, a bystander coming up in an arterial hemorrhage, a massive bleed with one of these sitting there, is not going to be able to read through these instructions effectively and uh, actually render care. So instructions are better and they're okay to have for a reference to train with uh, when you get them. But my opinion is that they are completely useless in the real world, and we're going to talk about why. So I had a couple experiences, and I, I want to talk about, I think it's three main uh, experiences I had that really made me uh, evaluate how I train for certain situations and my readiness. Now, we all have like those shower arguments, you know, where we either think back on a situation or have this fictitious like scenario in our head where, you know, somebody bus into the shopping mall and starts uh, assaulting their wife or something and you leap into action and you choke out the six foot five dude uh, on the floor and you're a hero. Um, maybe that's just me. I don't know. Uh, but we all have these fictitious things in our heads and it's really not realistic in any way, shape or form. You know, we all think we can, you know, outperform certain people. And this is somewhat tied into the Dunning Krieger curve where, you know, you have very little knowledge in something and you overestimate your ability in that arena. Um, and then the more knowledge you gain, the more you realize that uh, you're full of crap and that's not how it's going to be. So why is this important? What does stress actually do to us in the moment and why does it diminish our ability to perform tasks that were previously easy uh, in the classroom or in our head scenarios? Uh, really, it does all sorts of things. So first and foremost, it kind of causes us to get tunnel vision, both literally and figuratively. So with that, we don't see everything that's going on. You'll have a provider that's just trying to start an IV, trying to start an IV, and they are completely unaware of everything else that's going on around them. You also have auditory exclusion is a pretty common thing to get. It's one of the first uh, signs of extreme stress where we are not paying attention to our environment. Uh, we are focusing in, and that's a survival mechanism to keep us from getting sensory overload, but we're not able to take in other auditory information. We also have a dim diminishment of fine motor skills. This becomes a big deal with like tourniquet application. This becomes a big deal in like even getting your finger into the trigger guard uh, as a law enforcement officer, like really simple tasks that we can do all the time. Uh, in not a stressful situation become difficult for us. Um, for me, like that's the rat's tourniquet. That's the big eye opener is that you can throw that on really easy in a classroom. You think, hey, this thing works. But uh, ultimately, you try to do that when you're really stressed out, like things are just not going well and you lose that ability to grip really well. I've had that with IV starts. They've also found that with the uh, kind of tunnel vision is they did a study with residents where they gave them like a really simple a uh, task, and then they gave him them the same task under stress. And the two groups, what they found is that both were able to come to the same diagnosis, but the one group was able to think of a lot of differential diagnoses, where the other group was only able to think of 
what their primary diagnosis was. So those are just some of the effects, and we'll talk about a little bit more uh, as we go into it. We know, uh, essentially, it all comes down to we know that stress makes us bad at our jobs. So I have uh, a couple examples of when this happened to me, and we're going to talk about kind of my experiences and how I was able to overcome that. Uh, but how it's still something that I have to work on constantly, and I'm far from perfect when it comes from performing under these uh, really high-octane situations. So the first example I have is more of a general example, and this was when I was a uh, new EMT on a volunteer agency in Wisconsin, didn't run many calls, and I would get on scene and I would, like, tear the bag apart. Uh, you know, I'd run into the call, I'd run, uh, which we'll talk about that later, um, but go into the call and then you'd like get down next to somebody having difficulty breathing, you'd tear the bag apart trying to find a non-rebreather for them. And, you know, it really made me ineffective. I wasn't able to find the right things in the bag. I was not able to like really address that patient, really focus in on what was going on. Second example that comes to mind, and this isn't necessarily the only like couple times this has happened to me, but these are the times that I remember for this video. I was through the ILEA Police Academy, the reserve police academy uh, and I was on my uh, rides out in the county with my FTO and we got dispatched to a uh, teenager that uh, basically was sending suicidal threats to his girlfriend down at Des Moines and he was taking pictures of him with a rifle so we know it's a possible armed suspect um, there we're responding to help this kid but there's also a risk to us as first responders you know whether he wants to go suicide by cop or um, just, you know, is in a fight or flight and decides to fight, you know, he, he's armed. So we get there, we knock on the front door, no answer, knock again, no answer. It's like 11 o'clock at night. So I back off the door a little bit. My FTO says, Hey, stay here in case he comes out, but I'm going to go around back to see if lights are on, uh, see if we're, you know, what's going on here. And no sooner did he get to the back of the house and the front door flies open and this teen comes out with his rifle. Now he didn't point it at us. Um, he was just wondering why somebody was knocking on his door at, you know, 11 at night. So I, I drew on him. I drew my handgun, drew down, and I froze. I could not think of the right words that were ostensibly, uh, get on the ground now. Um, sheriff's office, get on the ground. And I could not think of those words. And I was like, uh. Uh, and luckily, only a couple seconds after that, my FDO came around the corner with a swan gun, was able to give him commands. He complied. Everything was fine. We got him the help he needed. And, you know, all's well that ends well. That was probably the most eye opening. It was the most acute event I had had up to that point of my inability to perform. That was something that I practiced in police academy. You know, you draw your gun, they get on the ground. Mainly you're doing that with stationary targets. Now, I think they've changed some of that training, but for me, it was, you know, on a range making commands and it's just not a stressful environment. You know, even uh, when they're simulating stressful environments, I know that that mannequin's life is not in danger. I know that my life is not in danger. So it's even though there might be a level of stress, it's not real. And that's actually what one of these articles discusses. It was done by NASA is that when we train uh, under stress, we're not really training under the same stress. We can simulate it, but ultimately that airline's pilot knows when he's in a sim simulator, he's not killing 300 people because he didn't know an emergency procedure. He knows that. He's able to function through that. Um, you know, same with police officers, same with paramedics, you know, anybody. So our ability to train this is pretty hard. Our ability to um, actually like show what effects uh, stress can cause is also relatively difficult because all of these studies are done in a laboratory, essentially. It's hard to do that in the real world. So we have that. And then uh, recently, another broad, kind of a broad example is, you know, when we are trying to give a medication on the helicopter, we carry a lot of meds, you know, everything we, we have a pretty good memory on things. You know, we know when things are indicated, but sometimes we have to look at what is the dosing scheme for that. Um, and I had a patient that was actively seizing. Um, they had gotten a lot of other stuff. So we're going to a med that I wasn't quite as familiar with. I, you know, dropped to my knees on the helipad, you know, open the bag, get the drug thing out. And I go to the app that has the protocols. I click on the button and I stared at that seizure protocol for you know, probably 15 to 30 seconds and reread this thing because I just, I had no reading comprehension and I had to stop, take a breath, look at it, focus before I was able to actually see what the app was telling me. Along those same lines, uh, we had uh, relatively recently, we had a gal in a car accident. Uh, we got in the back of the ambulance and it was clear that she needed a needle decompression, uh, for a, a building tension pneumothorax. So it's a procedure that I've 
done probably about two dozen times, so not a ton, but I've had some reps on it. It's something that I actually teach on this channel on how to do and identify landmarks. And I like, I, I paused. I was kind of slowly trying to get the needle out of the bag because I was trying to remember, do I go over the rib or do I go under the rib? And I was completely blanked out on what I was supposed to do there. So obviously, you know, came around to it, thought through it, took a deep breath and was able to deliver the procedure safely. But it wasn't something that was intuitive as it is usually when I'm in that training environment. So what does this all mean and what can we do about it? Uh, really, we can stress inoculate ourselves to an extent. We can't cover every single situation. We're not always going to be able to perform. And regardless of how well we train, our ability to do something in a fictitious scenario is always going to be better than how we do it in the real world scenario. You know, no, your adrenaline's not going to kick in and you're going to be able to do it. We see people do that, like that kind of mentality all the time with like fitness tests. They're like, oh, I'll be able to do it when the pressure's on. No, you're going to do so much worse when the pressure is on in these situations. So here's my approach to it. Not one size fits all. It might not be something that works for you, but it has worked for me for the most part. Uh, the first thing that I do is, one, I make sure I'm competent in it. Um, every morning when we're checking out the helicopter or going through the Bearcat, whatever it is, if I put my hand on something and I'm not immediately comfortable with its use, its dosage, its uh, indications, contraindications – that's a mental trigger for me to go and look it up. Even if I'm pretty sure, if I even have a little bit of hesitation, I will look that up. I will talk to my partner. I'll make sure that is something that I am addressing in that moment. Uh, because if you're uncomfortable, that's your subconscious telling you that you don't know something. If you're like, oh, I hope we don't get a pediatric patient today. Like, they scare me. Why do they scare you? So that's, that's kind of the first step for me is making sure that I have built competence in whatever area that is. The next part of that is going to be mental rehearsals. Now, this isn't that shower argument we were talking about earlier. This is me going to a call with my partner, and sometimes I'll say it out loud, sometimes I'll just rehearse in my head of like, hey, if this, then that. So a good example is like, hey, we're going to somebody that has a hemorrhagic stroke at this facility, and we're taking him down to a comprehensive stroke center for a uh, potential surgery. And we, we think, okay, so we're going to get there. If their Glasgow Coma Scale is under 8%, um, if they've had a seizure, uh, if they've decreased rapidly in whatever time, we're going to intubate them. All right, what what are our meds we're going to use for a stroke? All right, we're going to use uh, rocuronium and you know ketamine. Uh, you know, take your pick. So we're going to dose those out, and then we think, all right, well, what's our threshold for not doing it? Well, you know, if they've been stable for a prolonged period of time, you know, if uh, you know fill in the blank there. So we're thinking about both why we do it, why we wouldn't. All right. So we're going to a stroke patient. What if it's not a hemorrhagic stroke? What if it's a uh, thrombotic stroke and we're going to do TPA? What's our dosing scheme? How do we do that? All right. Let's say the diagnosis shifts. How are we going to like look at this? What are we looking for in Bell's palsy? And we just rehearse the different things that could happen in your head. Now, does that cover everything? Absolutely not. It does not. And you can get on scene and be like, wow, that's out of left field. I have no idea what it is. But it helps to have a game plan moving in. And I personally like talking through it with my partner, like, hey, I'm going to go to the head. I'm going to assess airway. Can you go get report from the nurse while I start doing that full body? Um, you know, or, hey, I'm going to talk to the crew before we actually see the patient and get their story and then uh, lay eyes on them. And I want you to go assess them and tell me what you think uh, based, you know, solely on your observations. So, Having that rehearsal is absolutely huge, um, and that's something that's made a big difference. A big difference for me, especially like looking at the protocols and the dosing schemes beforehand before uh, you get there. And the kind of last part of it we we talked about a little bit is practicing under stress. It's not the same, um, but you know, having that siren in the background making communication hard, having flashing lights or low light or somebody screaming at you, that adds. Uh, something that you can work through. And what I have found through practicing and then using in the real world is that sometimes I just need to take a breath. Um, usually before I get to bedside, like right before I walk into the patient's room, right before I open the doors to the ground ambulance that we're intercepting with, I will like literally take a pause and I will pause for 10 seconds. I will take a big breath and try to clear my mind. Um, you know, obviously not completely empty. It's close to there anyways, but I'll try to clear my mind, reset, and just 
be calm. Even if you're not feeling calm, if you act calm, that action will translate into actually feeling that way. Um, you know, I think there was some research study that said if you like purposely smile, even if you don't feel like you want to smile, you'll be happier in certain situations. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of this concept uh, here. Um, a couple pieces of advice that I give to uh, students that ride with us, you know, or less experienced um, people that I work with is never to run. Um, running is a great way to get the heart rate up and get you stressed before anything starts. Now, this isn't to say we're lackadaisically walking up to the house where somebody's dead inside, but I am not running inside because that is increasing my tunnel vision. It's increasing my heart rate, my adrenaline levels, um, and I'm not going to perform well. So I move with a purpose, but you'll never see me running to an emergency scene. Uh, really, the data on stress inoculation basically says that if we are able to address stressful situations, uh, train competence, it decreases anxiety about certain situations, which also decreases long-term potential issues such as PTSD. If we are well-trained in how to respond to things, we have less uh, PTSD. I think there was another study done by the military that's along these same lines that they looked at what, when soldiers are getting PTSD, and they found that... Um, you know, a special operations sol soldier that is given an objective, they're told like, hey, you are the aggressor, you're going into the house, you're getting this person, and you're bringing him out, or you're shooting him, or you're planting his, I don't know. You're doing one of those things. Those people have far less uh, PTSD than the soldier that's told, hey, you're going to patrol this really general area, and hopefully you don't hit any IEDs. And the difference there is control. The one soldier has control over their situation. They're, they're given an objective. They're the aggressor. The other one is waiting to become the victim. And that is a huge mindset shift. So in EMS, this translates to being competent. If you have an objective, if you know where your endpoint is and you're going in with that mission, you're going to be less you're going to be less the victim. So making sure you're competent, making sure you can perform those tasks and then practicing those tasks under stress, even if it's imperfect stress, at least you're starting to get used to thinking through that brain fog, thinking through that tunnel vision. That being said, once again, even though you are practicing, even though you are simulating it, that does not mean that you will not have hiccups. That will not. That does not mean you will not have days where you walk in and you mess something up or are so focused on applying that pelvic binder that you don't even notice that the patient lost a pulse. You know, all of those things are very real and you shouldn't feel like you did something necessarily wrong uh, in that moment. Just know that next time it's on you to fix it. So uh, if you guys have any questions about this topic, I hope this wasn't too rambly, um, but if you have any questions, comments, what I'd really like to see down there is personal experiences uh, with acute stress. Like, am I off the mark? Did you have a different experience than this? Or is this something that you've seen? Obviously, only as you're comfortable. But all of that being said, I look forward to seeing you next week. 